Welcome to our adult Bible study for Easter morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This morning we're going to take a look at the events of Easter morning according to John's Gospel. But before we do that, let's, as we did last Sunday, take a look at, at where we're going to be going in the next few weeks. This morning, as I said, we'll look at John chapter 20. The next Sunday, Sunday April 19th, we'll look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We begin our, our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon says he's tried everything and he's found it all to be meaningless. The next Sunday, April 26th, we'll go on to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, where Solomon says the reason everything is meaningless is because of death. Remember that we said this would be a great study to share with others. As Solomon wrestles with this question, what is the meaning of life? Or is there any meaning at all? He comes to a beautiful answer, uh, one that, that we can only share as believers in Christ. To this morning's study then, we'll look at the events of Easter morning according to John's Gospel. And let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. I'm going to use the hymn, Like the Golden Sun Ascending, uh, stanzas three and four. You have died for my transgression. All my sins on you were laid. You have won for me salvation. On the cross, my debt was paid. From the grave I shall arise and shall meet you in the skies. Death itself is transitory. I shall lift my head in glory. Grant me grace, O blessed Savior, and your Holy Spirit send, that my life and my behavior may be pleasing to the end, that I may not fall again into death's grim pit and pain, whence by grace you have retrieved me, and from which you have relieved me. Amen. All right, John chapter 20, if you would uh, open up your Bibles, if you would like, or uh, you can follow along on the screen, we'll have the text there for you. So John chapter 20 begins this way. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Matthew, Mark, Luke... The other gospel writers tell us that there were other women who accompanied Mary as she made her way to the garden tomb. Those women were going to anoint a dead body, not to see if the promised resurrection had taken place. They were carrying with them those aromatic powders that they would use to anoint Jesus' dead body. And the biggest question on their minds was, how would they possibly move that stone? But when Mary got there, the stone was already moved. And this is where Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account separates from John's account because those other three gospel writers now tell us the events of, of the resurrection morning from the viewpoint of those other women. But John tells it from Mary Magdalene's perspective. When she saw that that stone had been removed, she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Notice how she has jumped to some wrong conclusions, hasn't she? John does not name himself in his gospel. He simply identifies himself as the one Jesus loved. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. They didn't waste any time, these two disciples, Peter and John, but immediately set off and raced to the tomb. Peter, I'm sorry, John gets there first and is more cautious. He stays outside. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Simon Peter, true to his personality, does not hesitate. When he gets there, he came along behind John and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there 
as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Notice John has a, a level of detail here that could only come from an eyewitness. The strips are in their folds. The piece of cloth that was tied around the head is folded and off by itself. Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. John, when he saw the evidence inside the tomb, believed. The other Gospels tell us that Peter, on the other hand, was confused. Neither of them realized that Jesus had to rise from the dead from the scriptures. All right, this is where you pause the video and take a look at the following questions. Uh, if you're studying with someone, you can discuss these things together. If you're uh, doing this on your own, just, just take some time to, to think through this. So what conclusion did Mary jump to when she arrived at the tomb? What convinced Peter and John that Jesus had risen? And how did the disciples' findings at the tomb support our faith? All right, go ahead and pause the video and restart it again when you are ready. All right, what did you come up with? What conclusion did Mary jump to when she arrived at the tomb? Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their accounts tell us that the other women, when the stone was rolled away, went inside and looked, and then they heard that wonderful message from the angels, He is not here, He is risen. Mary Magdalene missed that. When she saw the stone rolled away, she jumped to a conclusion, and that was the, the only one her mind could come up with. Someone stole the body. So she missed initially the angel's message, and she ran back to tell Peter and John her only conclusion Someone stole the body. What convinced Peter and John that Jesus had risen? At least John. It was the conditions inside the tomb. I mean, think about it. If you were going to steal a body, you would just take it. You wouldn't unwrap it from those strips of cloth that Jesus had been wrapped in. Those strips of cloth were still lying there. And in the, in the, the Greek word there gives the, the idea even that, that the folds were still in place. The folds were lying there. And then the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' face, that was neatly folded up off to the side. Now, if you were going to steal a body, A, you wouldn't unwrap it, and B, if you, for some strange reason, did, you wouldn't make sure everything was nice and neat. And in fact, the, the folds of those the cloths actually gave the impression that the body had passed through it. Jesus, at times after his resurrection, passed through doors without opening them. It would seem that his body passed through these cloths. How do the disciples' findings at the tomb support our faith? You know, later on in John chapter 20, we're told that Jesus appeared to all the disciples except Thomas, do you remember the account? And then when they told Thomas, he said, unless I see him, unless I put my, hand, my finger where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe. And, and sometimes we give Thomas a bit of a bad rap there and we say, well, Thomas, you should have believed just based on the words. After all, John says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But it didn't work that way for any of those first witnesses. There was amazing, convincing proofs that Jesus gave his disciples that he was alive to those eyewitnesses. And now those eyewitness accounts, those become the words through which we believe. That's what Jesus and John was talking about later on in John chapter 20. They saw these amazing proofs, these convincing proofs, and then they wrote about them. And it's through their written record that we believe. And that includes what Peter and John found inside the tomb, evidence that the body was not stolen, but Jesus had, in fact, risen from the, from the dead. 
All right, let's continue then in John chapter 20. And we are at uh, middle of verse 10 says that the disciples returned to their homes. And now verse 11. I'll make this a little bit bigger on the screen for you. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. You know, those who contend that the Bible is somehow anti-women fail to see just how central women are to the testimony about Jesus. And you see that in the resurrection account especially. The first people to see Jesus risen from the dead were these women on Easter morning. And they're also the first to spread the good news. Mary is outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Women, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. She's still clinging to that only possible explanation in her mind. And I don't know where they have put him. She says she senses a presence behind her, and she turns around. And she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize him. He asked her, same question the angels asked, Woman, why are you crying? It's a strange question to ask in a cemetery, isn't it? But in light of what's just happened, it makes perfect sense. Why would you be crying now? How could you possibly be sad? The world has been redeemed. Jesus is risen. The only tears that make any sense right now are tears of joy. But so intense is Mary's grief that she's missing all of that. And so she's stuck. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Why doesn't she recognize who Jesus is? Is it perhaps because in her grief she just can't think clearly? Is it because her eyes are blurred from, from crying, she can't see clearly? Is it, is it because she simply just didn't expect Jesus. I mean, if she was one of the people there when Jesus was taken down from the cross, and she was, and she saw that dead body and helped bring it to the tomb, the last thing she would have expected was to see Jesus alive. Did Jesus look different than he did before? Did Jesus intentionally keep her from recognizing him? All of those are, are possibilities. We're not certain. What we do know is that, as in so many other times in Jesus' appearances, it wasn't the sight of Jesus first, but it was his words. It was what he did that convinced them that it was Jesus. All right, again, let's take a look at the questions here. How could Peter and John, and, and, and now Mary, how could everyone have forgotten about Jesus' prophecies? Secondly, what did Mary's grief keep her from seeing? And then let's, let's apply that to our lives. Do we sometimes become so wrapped up in our problems that we fail to see the answer to the problem? And maybe you could come up with some specific examples there. Again, if you're studying on your own, uh, spend some time thinking through those things. If you're with someone else, uh, discuss it. And when you are finished, uh, restart the video. All right, how could everyone have forgotten about Jesus' prophecies? Well, remember that they had witnessed Jesus die this violent death. Many of them had seen that spear go up from the Roman soldier into Jesus' side to make sure that he was dead. Those that didn't see it probably heard about it. Seeing Jesus alive was the last thing they expected. The idea of someone dying and, and rising again from the dead, that was almost too much to believe. You know, I, I think there might be a lesson here for us. It's easy for us with Jesus' words just to hear them and, 
and say, okay, I got that. I wonder how many times the disciples listened to Jesus' words and said, okay, yeah, we got it, Jesus. What we really need to do is to think deeply about that word of God, to meditate on it. How does that, that prayer go that we sometimes say in our services? We ask God to help us read, learn, and inwardly digest his word, to think deeply about it. It took the disciples some time for that word to sink in. What did Mary's grief keep her from seeing? Well, the fact that Jesus was alive and he was right there with her, right? You know, Mary leads with her heart and she so much wanted to fix it herself. She said to the gardener, tell me where the body is and I'll go get it and put it back where it belongs. I'll take care of everything. And sometimes when we're faced with problems in life, that's our reaction to, I'll, I'll fix this, I'll make it right, it's all on me. But Easter is not just a past event we celebrate, it's a present reality. Jesus is alive right now. That means he's with us as our good shepherd to help us, to take care of us. Instead of becoming anxious, overwhelmed by our problems, instead we turn to him in prayer. Cast all your cares on him, Peter says, because he cares for you. He's with us to turn everything in our life into a blessing for us, to work it out for our good. He's here to help us with our problems. All right, let's go on and finish up here. Verse 16. I'll make this bigger again. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, a term which means teacher. So often, again, it's Jesus' words or what he does. Think of the disciples on the way to Emmaus. It's when he broke the bread that opens people's eyes to see who Jesus is. Here it's his calling her name, Mary, and she realizes who he is. Jesus has to say to her, do not hold on to me. He doesn't say, don't touch me. He's saying, don't hold on to me. You can picture Mary grabbing a hold of him and not ever wanting to let go, not wanting to lose him again. But Jesus has to, to tell her, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But he does give her something very important to do. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary didn't hesitate. She immediately went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Last questions then for this study. How has our relationship with God changed because of Jesus' death and resurrection? There was no need for Mary's tears. Why do we shed tears today? And then finally, Mary had good news to share. So do you. With whom will you share it? All right. Work through those questions. When you're done, uh, start the recording. All right. How has our relationship with God changed since Jesus' death and resurrection? And Jesus told Mary, tell the disciples, I'm returning to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Jesus' death has changed our relationship with God. It has reconciled us to God by taking away those sins that stood between us and God. God is our Father, and he loves us as his dear children. That makes us Jesus' brothers and sisters, and it makes us brothers and sisters of one another, too. It had to give Jesus special joy to be able to say those words, to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. That was the result of his saving work. There was no need of Mary's tears. Why do we shed tears today? We shed tears because of physical pain, and emotional pain because of loneliness. We shed tears as we stand in the cemetery, as we walk away from the remains of our loved ones. We shed tears because of the consequences of sin all around us. But Jesus took away our sins 
And that means one day the consequences of our sin will also all be taken away. One day he will call our name, as he called Mary's name, and he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Mary had good news to share, so do you. With whom will you share it this week? Thank you for watching this video and studying with me. I would ask you to watch a little bit longer. I've got a, a video I would like you to see. Uh, and then please join us again next week for our study of Ecclesiastes. May God fill your lives with Easter joy. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. All right. How has our relationship with God changed since Jesus' death and resurrection? And Jesus told Mary, tell the disciples, I'm returning to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Jesus' death has changed our relationship with God. It has reconciled us to God by taking away those sins that stood between us and God. God is our Father, and he loves us as his dear children. That makes us Jesus' brothers and sisters, and it makes us brothers and sisters of one another, too. It had to give Jesus special joy to be able to say those words, to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. That was the result of his saving work. There was no need of Mary's tears. Why do we shed tears today? We shed tears because of physical pain and emotional pain, because of loneliness. We shed tears as we stand in the cemetery, as we walk away from the remains of our loved ones. 
We shed tears because of the consequences of sin all around us. But Jesus took away our sins. And that means one day the consequences of our sin will also all be taken away. One day he will call our name, as he called Mary's name, and he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Mary had good news to share, so do you. With whom will you share it this week? Thank you for watching this video and studying with me. I would ask you to watch a little bit longer. I've got a, a video I would like you to see. Uh, and then please join us again next week for our study of Ecclesiastes. May God fill your lives with Easter joy.